Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome to another episode of Role Models. Today I have a special treat for you. My guest is none other than Giselle Bonet. And let me tell you about this lovely lady who is with me today. Giselle calls herself an Afro-Indigenous Bruja. She is a multi-certified hypnotherapist and intuitive life coach. And I will tell you, Giselle's been down that road and back again. I relate so much to her as an entrepreneur, as a minority woman, and as a single parent. Giselle, like many of us, has struggled with anxiety and depression and lack of self-worth, but everything changed when she connected her past to her present in the subconscious. So cool. Through the power of healing, she found her inner magic and her life began to flourish as she manifested the life that she wanted to live. And now, Giselle, I believe, is a true role model because she helps others do the same using ancestral healing, hypnotherapy, and powerful breath work. These are the medicines of our ancestors. Welcome, Giselle. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. I am so happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to have you now. Wow, you've got so much exciting stuff going on in your life. And I want to talk about all of these things that you are so talented at in helping others to heal. So first off, before we dive into that, I'd love for everybody to just get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, anything that you'd like to share? Yes. So I grew up in the island of Quisqueya, which is known as Dominican Republic. And I grew up with my mother and my siblings and my mother practiced voodoo, Dominican voodoo. So my life was filled with magic. <laughs> it was, I was her little follower and student. I thought everything she did was absolutely fascinating and the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my life is my mother. And she also is still an herbalist. Uh, she still lives in Quisqueya and she still practices herbalism. And so I was very much in the spiritual realm when I was a child. Uh, then came my 20s and my 30s and I disconnected more so in my 30s from it a little bit and just kind of did life and the busyness of life without the grounding of my spirituality. And obviously that resulted in some not so great curves and paths and journeys. And that's what happens when you're operating from not your inner wisdom and not from your grounding. And then in my early 40s, I came back to it. Life just brought me back to it. It was, you know, it was almost like it was either that path or just keep going in the same way I was going, which wasn't working for me at all. So coming back to my inner grounding and my wisdom and my practices and my spirituality changed everything, changed everything about my life. And then uh, through that, I had already been doing work uh, in the education field on uh, educating mothers and parents. And it was a lot, what I call now more on the surface level, because we were talking about tools and skills and I've transitioned over to a deeper level of helping people really to come back to themselves and to realize just how majestic they are and how much inner power they have. And so we work more on the soul level, the spiritual level, which is really where all of the changes happens you know, for us mm -hmm. as human beings. So that's where I'm at now. Amazing. And it's so important to designate that what happens when you do lose that side of yourself, as you did, as I had done, is, you know, getting into this place where, you, where um, your spirituality isn't really front and center and superficiality or the busyness of every day gets in the way. You do lose that sense of self-worth and you forget how precious and how valuable we all are. And so I think it's fascinating that, yeah, it takes a while to come back to it. And then it's almost like that recognition that you were always the thing that you've been looking for. Yes. <laughs> it's always been with you. Yes. Wow. So, so tell me about hypnotherapy. I remember going to Las Vegas and seeing a show <laughs> where there was a hypnotherapist. They called people up on stage and made them do crazy stuff. I have a feeling that's not what you do. Can you no. tell us a little bit about it? 
So yes, unfortunately, that is an idea that people do have because that's what we see. That's what we get presented with, which is more like performative hypnotherapy. But the thing with hypnotherapy is you are always in control. No one ever takes over your subconscious or makes you do anything you don't want to do. You are in control. But so when I was first introduced to hypnotherapy myself, it was through that healing process that I was doing. And I kind of remember thinking, all right, I've seen it myself too. Like I've seen the shows and then past that, I didn't know what it was, you know, but I was open to the idea of, of the, it was recommended. So I went and then I learned that it is going into the subconscious level. So in our, in, in our daily lives, we actually do go into self hypnosis through our daily lives. Like you, you might be doing work or, um, or walking. And then next thing you know, you come back, you're like, Oh, oh where was I? That was you in self hypnosis. <laughs> and so when you zone out a little bit, that's you in more of a subconscious level, which is what hypnotherapy does. The difference is, that when you're working with a uh, hypnotherapist, they're facilitating that journey for you. So they're creating that space for you to step into your subconscious. And then depending on what your desired results are, as a facilitator, I will ask a series of questions to get you to your own answers. So your answers are within, your answers are in your subconscious. And as a hypnotherapist is my job to help guide you to your own answers. And all kinds of revelations happen when someone is in the subconscious. It's amazing. The things that they are, that they will say, that they will discover. Sometimes they, they wow themselves. And a lot of times that, that is shown through emotions. So you'll have someone just express emotion, either laughter or crying or anything in between when they have a revelation of what they were able to discover in their subconscious. And it's, it's a, amazing to observe. I get out of it after the process and I'm always like, wow. And I'm usually taking notes while I'm facilitating because there's so much information and solutions and answers and discoveries that happen in a session. And then after the session, we bring it back to the cognitive. So the client will talk about what they experienced, what they connected, and then I will add to it with what I observed and what I connected. And then usually there's some sort of an action plan to put it into integration. And then usually, to be honest, is not more than two to four sessions before whatever that person came in to overcome is done is done like they you know which is my job is then done as well because that's my job for you to connect back to yourself and your wisdom and then move forward so mm -hmm. that's hypnotherapy in a in a nutshell <laughs> That's fascinating. So if somebody were to ask, like, what is the difference between being in hypnosis versus meditation? Or are they the same? They can be the same. So there's different ways of meditating. You know, I think a lot of times when we hear meditation, we're thinking about the kind where you focus on, where you clear your mind, you know, like you completely clear, clear your mind and you stay in that space or you're focusing on one thing and you stay in that space. That's a really common way of meditating. But you can also meditate and go into self-hypnosis and you are facilitating your own journey and you're traveling in your mind's eye to places that might be in this world or might be in the metaphysical space or might be completely imaginary, but still connecting to your guides and to your inner wisdom. So for sure, I know that's how I meditate and that definitely came about because of my abilities and the, and the things that I know about hypnotherapy, I just applied into my self meditation. I often find that when I'm driving, I almost get into that hypnotic state because it's almost like I'm clearing my mind. I'm not really thinking about where I'm driving. And then all of a sudden it's like, huh, I'm already here. And I didn't mm -hmm. even know, like I didn't even, you know, recognize the journey, but along the way I get these ideas and it almost feels mm -hmm. like I'm getting these bits of inspiration. And I was curious if it is almost like a lulling into a certain brainwave state, like a theta state or, or one of the, the, you the get, yeah. So you get into a deep, deep relaxation state. 
and especially when it's getting facilitated, it's almost as if you're about to fall asleep, but not quite fall asleep. And mm-hmm. In fact, when people are talking in hypnosis, they are talking like this. They will go, I see a house and walking like this, right? Now, when they get out of hypnosis and I ask them, how do you think you were talking? They will say, well, I I felt like I was yelling. Like I felt like I was being really loud. I said, I don't know that I was in hypnosis. (laughs) I'm like, you were not yelling. You were barely audible. (laughs) And so you go into very, your brain waves are in a very, very relaxed state. And then back to your point of like when you're driving sometimes and you zone out or any other time when you're like, oh, a way to integrate that is try to recall right then and there, where were you? Like, where were you? What kind of wisdom were you hearing? What kind of thoughts were you having? Because you can take that. That's your subconscious. You can take some of that and bring it into your conscious and start integrating it. So that is any time that you're going into that zone is already a self-hypnosis and is already you tapping into inner wisdom. Oh, that is so brilliant. Let's step into ancestral healing because I know that is another aspect of your work. Can you explain to everybody what that is? Yes, so ancestral healing. There's two different ways that people think of it. So ancestral healing can be where you're going back, let's say either past life or current life, kind of regressing back into your ancestors and healing some of what your ancestors did or didn't do. And that is a segment, but I don't necessarily work in that part of ancestral healing. What I work with ancestral healing is connecting to our guides. So some of our guides are ancestors from this life and ancestors from past life and again they we each have the ability with or without somebody else to actually discover this for ourselves so you can connect back like i'm connected back to an ancestor from my past life who comes to me often usually actually on this side of my body usually kind of like just leaning over and speaks to me and gives me guidance and this she's an ancestor from a past life and another thing with ancestor healing is science and research is showing what our ancestors knew, which is things that we now consider trendy, you know, mindfulness, meditation, going back to nature, herbalism, all of these things belong to our ancestors. And research, modern research is saying, we should do some of those things. They're actually really good for our emotional and mental wellness. And so part of ancestral healing is just tapping into who were your ancestors and what were their practices and then incorporating them into your current life. And so that's when science is really catching up to spirituality, but you're bringing it into your today modern life. So when you're talking about ancestral healing and past lives and things like that, I know a lot of people get like, oh, a little little bit intimidated and feel like, well, that doesn't really align with my beliefs. You know, they might be devout Christian and not Mm -hmm. necessarily buy into that. But I think that there's probably a way to interpret it as almost like your guardian angels, right? I think that a lot of people believe in guardian angels or an, an angel or, or that, you know, a, a parent, a, a grandmother, a grandfather is looking down on you and really thinking about you. And that knowledge, sometimes when you're even thinking about them and saying, oh, you know, I wish that person was here or that person would be so happy right now in that I've graduated college or I've, you know, gotten this promotion. And, and, and really it's that sense that you do have that connectedness. That is it. That is that line yes. of, of communication to those people that may have passed on or even those that are still in this realm, as it were, but may not necessarily be physically with you, but their spirit is because they're in your mind, they're in your, and they're in your field, as it were. Would you say that's yes. accurate? Yes, because even depending on your religion, like let's say, for example, Christianity, all of the writers and the people in the Bible are ancestors, you know, so when you're quoting a Bible verse and you're saying, Matthew said this, you Mm -hmm. are referring to an ancestor. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You can call it a guardian angel. It's another form of God. When I say spirit, a Christian might say, you know, they might say God is the Mm -hmm. same 
God with different names. And then there's a bunch of guides, which to a Christian might be the Bible. You know, the, the mm-hmm. people from the Bible might be their guides or an angel might be their guides. Or even their, like you were saying, their grandmother who is really close to them and gave them really good wisdom, but is no longer with them. That might be an ancestral guide. So it's applicable really in any form of whatever belief system you have, you can integrate it into your life in a way that feels comfortable to you. And speaking of ancestral healing in your mom, because I am dying to know a little bit more about your mom and the idea and the notion of voodoo, because I know it it is a little bit foreign to me in terms of a a term. I think a lot of people hear of it and they think of it as being a little bit like witchy, a little bit like dark magic, black magic. And And so I would love for you to just blow the lid off of that and and tell everybody like, what was your experience and, and how do you describe voodoo? I don't myself practice voodoo per se, um, but that's how my mom practiced. And so I was under her wing in that she took me to places that she went to, you know, she had her altar and, and it was it's just part of what my mother did. Uh, but with voodoo and a lot of people do think voodoo, black magic, I never saw any black magic. My mother didn't practice black magic. It is there. You can use it in that way, just like how you can use intentions in a negative way and you can try to manifest in a negative way. Uh, but it's not necessarily a dark religion. You know, it's not necessarily like a dark magic place. My mother used it for good. So when she did spiritual healings or readings for people, it was to help them overcome. It was similarly, honestly, to how I use breath work or uh, hypnotherapy or intuitive life coaching. She just used the resources and the gods and goddesses of voodoo to do that. Mm -hmm. And voodoo in the United States is called hoodoo. So it's, it's, you'll hear like in New Orleans and other people are using hoodoo, but voodoo was created from being colonized in Kiskeya, Dominican Republic. They were colonized, Haiti, same thing, colonized. And so the Africans had to hide their African religion and kind of tricked the colonizers into thinking that they were believing their religions, but actually they were still practicing their African religions. So in voodoo, you'll sometimes hear uh, some of the gods referred to as saints, you know, like, like Catholic saints. And the altars and the images are similarly to Catholic altars and images. But it's really, that's what they did to be able to fake out the colonizers into thinking, yeah, we're Catholic, we're practicing your religion, but really we're just using this image and we're actually honoring our God behind your image, you know? So it's really fascinating when you learn about it, but none of it came from darkness. Voodoo can definitely be used for good and to help heal people. And a part of that is the the ritual of using herbs and tinctures Mm -hmm. and things like that, which are, you know, very sacred and from nature, right? Yes. And it's very much connecting to your inner wisdom and to your guides. I mean, there are so many similarities to other forms of religion. And so it's all just... Again, it's all one God, and just the way that people practice it is different. But uh, my experience with Zuda was very positive. It reminds me of when I went to my first ayahuasca ceremony, and Mm -hmm. everybody would refer to ayahuasca as grandmother. And I never really understood it, but then I was like, you know what? There is so much wisdom in plants and the plant kingdom in nature. There is just a network of intelligence that surrounds us that we're only starting to really understand. And yeah. so, you know, it was, it was fascinating to have almost like this embodiment of the, the plant wisdom coming through to you, almost like an ancestor, but in, yes. in plants in a natural form. That is so fascinating because it's true. Nature has more wisdom than any of us living in this earth, you know, and and we assume it's just a plant or it's just a tree or it's just a flower, but they are all full of wisdom and guidance for us. And as you know, I have a lot of plants here. <laughs> I <laughs> talk to my plants. I tell everybody, <laughs> tell everybody how many plants you have. You, I, I have over a hundred plants and 900 square feet. 
<laughs> but the plants are really like it's another form of spirituality i just brought it into my home but i can look out into in fact it's a tree that i often look i'm looking at right now and i'll look at the leaves in the tree whenever i need to remind myself of abundance i'll look at the uh, leaves i'm like wow look at how many leaves are in just that small section of that plant and same thing with like our ocean you know we're lucky I mean, you know we we both live in southern california so i can go into the water at any point and i'll go and talk to the ocean actually more listen to the ocean than mm -hmm. talking but you know like listen to the messages of the ocean if i'm in a forest I'm listening. I'm like, what do you have to tell me? Because I know that nature has so much more wisdom than all of us because it's been here for so much longer. I've often heard about birds being messengers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I love going into my backyard and in the morning I meditate outside and I just listen to the bird song and mm -hmm. see so many beautiful hummingbirds. And more recently, I have seen, it's been so sweet, I've seen falcons and their little ones learning to fly oh, behind them. No. And it's, <laughs> it, it just warms my heart seeing these little tiny baby falcons. Oh, I'm wow. like, I've never seen baby falcons before, but they fly over. And I was like, yeah, this is, it's just magical. It's beautiful. Wow. Let's talk about breath work because I know that a lot of people realize, obviously, we're all breathing, we're alive mm -hmm. and breathing, but why is breath work so powerful? Mm. So we are breathing. We're breathing right now. Um, most of the time, though, we're taking shallow breaths. We're pausing a lot. Uh, our breath will kind of mimic whatever it is that we're going through at the time. That's why when you get when you get out in nature, you see a beautiful scene. You go, "That's so beautiful." It's like it kind of connects you back. Now, when you do breath work you are breathing in a way that actually does help connect you to your subconscious without going into hypnosis it actually does get you to a very similar state now unlike hypnosis where it's really facilitating you know I'm, I'm talking throughout and guiding and guiding that journey to get the person into their their inner wisdom or their story to that they need to discover with breath work the work happens within so I'm guiding the breath in the breathing session, and then I'm watching the person through the emotions, sometimes touching different parts of the body if I get the, the sense that that energy is stuck. But the work in the breath work is happening inside through the process of the whatever breathing technique that they're going through, they get into the subconscious, which is again, you'll see people expressing all kinds of emotions when they're in breathwork sessions. They, they might be you know, really vocal when they're doing their breathing, or they might cry, they might, ah, you know, and just release, like all kinds of emotions, because all that work is happening in the subconscious. So it takes us to another place that we typically are not, because you can't walk around doing all the breathing techniques and still have conversations with people, now on a daily you can be aware of your breath you know you can remember to breathe you can remember to take deeper breaths and you can pause and do a little breathing technique at any moment when you need to reset re-energize it helps even healing of the body obviously you're getting more oxygen into your body you're connecting your mind to your body and you definitely start with that in the beginning and then zoom you sink into the subconscious are there different levels of breath work like beginner intermediate and advanced there's different techniques which means you know you would start somebody on a level of breath work that they can do and then they can go from that technique to get even deeper into their breathing whereas there are different advanced breathing techniques that you wouldn't start a brand new beginner on so one of my favorite ways for breathing that anyone can do at any time is circular breathing circular breathing you do for you know you could do it for as long as you like but just be aware you're gonna feel high you know you're gonna definitely go into the realm can we do it can we do it together can we get high yes. together right now okay let's do some circular so, breathing all right um so when you start breath work i always tell people come back into your body our energy is usually out like my a lot of my energy right now is is with you is is right there where you are in our conversation and so you bring it back and you just come back into your body 
And then a quick way to do that is become aware of different places in your body. So that might be my neck. How's the back of my neck feeling? That might be how's my feet feeling? Where are my feet? What's holding me up right now? So the floor is holding me up. And then you kind of become aware of that. And you just start regulating your breathing. So regulating your breathing is just breathing in a comfortable place. However that feels. You're not trying to count. You're not trying to hold it. You're just breathing regularly. And again, becoming aware of the different parts of your body. You can take it even deeper by becoming aware of the spaces between you and the floor, the space between you and the chair. And then when you're ready, you're just going to start breathing in from your belly, taking it up to your chest, and not pause in between. So breathe in from your nose, take it down to your belly, exhale, do not pause, and inhale again. So it's going to look like this. And for those of you who are just listening and not watching, Giselle is very still. She does have her eyes open and her lips are slightly ajar, very slightly. And you can tell that she is breathing through her nose and almost lolling back and forth with her body. Yes. Just ebbing back and forth almost in a circular fashion, letting it yeah. increase up through her belly, up through her lungs, and then out again. And you continue that pace, not pausing. So if you found yourself pausing, then just know that next time you don't pause. You just continue. You can have your eyes open. You'll find that even that little bit that I did, my eyes were beginning to already glaze, you know, because I was already going into the subconscious. But it's just a continuous flow of circular breathing. There's nothing to do do but to just focus on that circular breathing when you feel comfortable you'll close your eyes keep going into the circular breathing and you will find you start to get this elevation inside and you're you start to feel a little lighter if you you're getting more oxygen than you normally would so if you are going to feel a little bit like whoa there's a lot going on in my head right now because you're getting a big dose of oxygen ongoing and you keep breathing through it if at any point you start to feel uncomfortable it's like whoa i'm really in another place and i maybe don't want to go there regulate back your breathing so you'll do it for as little or as long as you like you can if you decide i want to listen to music you can play some sound bath music or any other form of music a lot of times i'll recommend if you can not have music like really just be in your stillness without extra stimulation going on or trying to dictate how you should be feeling or not feeling and so if you're like i want to take a half hour to do this start you know maybe with five minutes and then work your way up to a half hour but even just now if you go oh, i want to i want to try it then just try it this is a way that when you're starting to feel tired and you know like that that afternoon dump where you're like Ugh, i need a i need a, a kick me i get like something to kick start me again sit for a minute sit for three minutes and do this and you'll feel elevated again it's almost mm -hmm. like a, a source of energy came up again and then you can continue on with your day that's when i need my 3 p.m coffee due to breath work instead <laughs> Now, yeah. interestingly enough, I, I, I'm familiar with the Wim Hof method. I know a lot of people that, you know, they think about the aggressive side of breath work. This is very nourishing. This feels very calming, mm -hmm. but yet still it gets you to a place of feeling more energized in a, in a very simple fashion, I think. Yes. Are there any watch outs though? I know that some people get concerned about hyperventilation or about gas exchange. The body does have an amazing ability to re-regulate itself, true, but are there any medical watchouts that people should be concerned about or think about as they're starting into breath work? So usually if you're pregnant, you want to kind of talk to your care provider and see which kind of breath works you can actually do. A lot of times there's not much you can do when you're pregnant, but just a few of them. 
And then anything else, normally you'll just check with your care provider and see. Just keep in mind, like I said, don't put a timer for 30 minutes and go, I'm going to circular breathe for 30 minutes. If that's your first time, that's usually too much. Like you're going to feel that kind of spacey feeling. And also keep in mind, yes, if you are doing a breath work where you feel uncomfortable where you feel like it doesn't feel good anymore it's actually and I don't mean that you're not willing to go into the space of healing because sometimes the space of healing doesn't feel good but I mean that it feels more work to actually do the breathing than to get into your subconscious that might not be the technique for you you might just need to do another technique and it's okay to stop it's okay to just say, that's not working for me. I'm going to go back to my breathing and then I'll go and see if there's another technique. For me, for example, I can't do the boxed breathings. That works really well for a lot of people who have anxiety is the box breathing, you know. Box me. breathing <laughs> is breathe in, hold it for one, mm -hmm. breathe out for one, hold it. for, And so it's almost like just a, a, a singular box that you're making yes. with your breath and holding inhale, exhale. So for me, that's one that gives me anxiety. Just like it's so much work for me to try and picture and keep up. And I'm like, I, I'm going to mess up. I'm, you know, so I'm not going to actually pause when I'm supposed to pause. <laughs> and so you find a style that actually works for you. And yeah, if you have medical conditions, if you're on certain medications, you always want to check with your care provider and with anything. Because just because things are natural doesn't mean that they're right for you. You might have to check something, you know, do something else instead. But for the average person that doesn't have any conditions, that doesn't do any, doesn't have any medications that might interact with it, you can do breathing techniques that feel comfortable and good to you. Now, for those people who are really into fitness and cardio, do they also need breath work or is this something to enhance their well-being? is where your intentions are when you're doing the breath work. So if you are, you know, running, you know, you're really processing a lot of oxygen, you could be running in a meditative state. You can be running in a self-hypnosis state. So it's, it's in the intention that you're putting into it. I power lift, I do heavy lifting with barbell. When I'm there, that's part of my, I call it part of my spirituality. I will process emotions, strong emotions, when I'm going to, let's say I'm going to squat, or I'm going to deadlift something, because I put the intention into it. Because Abby, right before I'm lifting that bar, I'm like, bringing that emotion into my body that I'm wanting to process out and process through because I'm going to make noise. So I'm going to use my body somatically to process it. And then I'll lift it with intention of processing. So yes, you can do when you're doing anything else that you do, you know, fitness wise, if you're doing it with that intention, that's mm -hmm. it, that intention is in mind when you're doing whatever fitness you're into. That is such great advice and, and such a good point. And an intention is everything. You know, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, working out because you just want a great body, but you're not really thinking about health, you know, you may be doing things in a different way than if you're thinking about nurturing yourself and caring for yourself and, and, and longevity. I do have a question though, because I know that a lot of people who are coming in to a place for healing feel like, you know, I really need help. I can't do this alone. I need a coach. I need a therapist. I need somebody to help guide me. Are there any words of comfort or anything that you would say to somebody who might be really going through it, that might be really yes. in the depths of despair? And I think a lot of people nowadays are in that place, right? Mm -hmm. What could they do to make even that little tiny bit of improvement in their well-being? Yes. So if you're currently going through what feels like a really hard time, Keep in mind what you're going through is a moment. You're going through a human experience moment. You have not arrived there. You're not going to stay there. This is not your forever. This is a moment that you're going through. The first thing would be an accepting of that moment. I accept that right now I feel like and put the words of what you're feeling. I accept that this is where I'm at. I accept that right now things feel really, really hard for me and I don't feel that I have the tools to overcome it. This is the state I'm in. So that would be number one is accepting it, but accepting it as it just is. It's, it's without judgment. 
without beating yourself up while you're accepting it. So it's not, I'm accepting it because I suck at this and I can't do it. That would be accepting it with judgment. You just stating it as it is and that where you are is where you're supposed to be. Even if it feels really, really crappy, this is where you're supposed to be because your next step from here is just going to go higher. You're gonna take this as an opportunity of what do I have to learn about this? because I'm here for a reason. So what do I have to learn about this so that I can look back and go, ah, that version of myself, I'm not gonna be again. I've moved and I elevated it higher, closer to my whole. We're all born whole, we're all born complete. And so you're just coming back to that. You're not broken. <laughs> you're just coming back to remembrance of your wholeness. The second thing would be realizing that there are a bunch of different modalities for healing. And they may not all be for you, and that's okay. So therapy might be it for you, and that's, that's your modality for healing. But it might also not be okay. So just because the masses go to therapy and you're like, but I should go, this is where I want, but your heart's going, it might not. Maybe there's something else. That's okay. What's your something else? Find the person, and you'll know. Trust your instincts. You're going to know. When you connect to somebody, you'll hear their voice, you'll see their picture, you'll read whatever they might have on their website or whatever somebody else is saying about them. Trust your instincts because you'll find your healer when it feels good. My clients will come to my website, they kind of learn about me and they're like, I knew you were the one the moment I saw on your website. And so, and, it, and you may not feel that when you come to my website, you might feel, ah, that isn't it. I, then that would not, that'd be true. I probably would not be it. You'll go and you'll connect with somebody else where your gut, follow your gut feeling. If it's in your heart, usually you'll feel excitement, openness. If at all you're talking to somebody and there's tightness, that's your body saying, no, nope, that's not your person. And you'll find the right modality for you. You might try one and then realize that wasn't it. But maybe from there, somebody recommends you. That happened to me. Someone recommended me, that same person recommended me to another person and that was it. Mm -hmm. So is A, accept where you are without judgment. You are in a, you're actually in a, believe it or not, you are in a great place to, to reach your greatness if you open the door to that opportunity. Because you can go both ways. You can go open one door or you become a victim to where you are. And then you kind of just stay there. And that's a really sucky place to be. Or you open the other door of, whoa, wait a minute. There from this place, I might elevate myself coming back to the remembrance of just how majestic I am. And you go in through that door and you listen to your instincts, you're gonna find your healer. You're gonna find the person. And I shouldn't say your healer, because honestly, you're your healer. <laughs> you're gonna find the person who's gonna help you find that about yourself, that you actually have and always will be your healer. And then you'll learn tools. You'll learn one tool, two tools, three tools. You start integrating them into your life and you'll start to find everything I needed, everything I desired, everything I wanted was here all along. But you start to have that realization of it and then you just go up from there. So that would be my advice, someone going through a hard time. Oh my gosh, so brilliant, Giselle. Thank you so much for all of your words of wisdom. What a rich and powerful podcast session we have had today. I want everybody to go visit Giselle's website. It is GiselleBaume.com. She's also on Instagram on I am Giselle Baume. And learn all about her and find your own path towards your own healing. If you are so called to do that, Remember that wellness is everything. Take care of yourself. We are here for you. The human beauty movement is all about beauty positivity, but it is from a spirit of heart, from a spirit of wellness, because we care. So I want to thank you so much, and we will see you for another episode next week. Take thank care. Thank you.